heart of the west of England. On this bleak moorland, many men have lived and died and left behind their monuments in enduring granite. But none of Devon's sons has carved such a monument of lasting fame as Francis Drake, sea captain, navigator and explorer, and first Englishman to sail round the world. Just below the little town of Tavistock on the River Tavy stands the farm where he was born in the year 1545. Here he lived till he was four years old with his father Edmund Drake, a farmer and preacher. Driven from his home by religious persecution, Drake did not return to the West Country until he was 21 and already apprenticed to the sea. On the River Tamar, which flows into Plymouth Sound, stands the ancient borough of Saltash, its houses clustered on the steep river bank. In this little cottage lived Mary Newman. The masterful Drake wooed her, obtained her promise to wait for him on his long sea voyages, and in 1559, when he was 24 years old, he married her in the grey granite parish church of St. Budo in token of which we can still read the entry in the parish register. The Port of Plymouth today. The Port of Plymouth in Tudor times. This tiny town was one of the great ports of Elizabethan England. Within these houses, Tudor nobles and merchant adventurers laid plans for voyages of exploration and gain. Many were the tales of gold and treasure uncountable told in guarded whispers below their oaken rafters. Through the narrow, twisted streets tramped sea captains and sailors as they still do today. From these harbour walls, the fleets of Grenville and Hawkins set out on their year-long dangerous voyages. But of all the famous expeditions which started from this spot, none in all English history was so daring, so magnificent, as the voyage of the Golden Hind around the world. Barely the size of the modern trawler, she sailed from Plymouth Sound with four small consorts in November of the year 1577, and with less than 200 men packed into their tiny cabins. Their instruments of navigation were the compass and the cross staff, by which they could sight the stars or sun. With these, those early navigators could hope to reckon their latitude fairly accurately by astronomical calculations. Drake himself carried this tiny device, which contained nearly all the instruments and information available to the Elizabethan navigator. Yet with this equipment, these men roamed the world. Little wonder that fear, fear of the unknown, was their unbidden passenger. He coils around the mysterious corners of their charts. But the Elizabethan seaman was an optimist. Who knew what curious sights might lie in wait for the traveller? So Drake's little convoy left England. It crossed the Atlantic to South America, then into the Pacific, and north as far as Canada, then south to India, and back to England by way of South Africa. The early days of this daring voyage did not go well, and Drake had to execute one of his officers for mutiny. So troubled was the expedition that he cried in his despair, I have taken in hand that I know not in the world how to go through with. It passeth my capacity. It has even deprived me of my wits to think of it. But at last, fortune favored Drake. He captured a treasure ship, and loaded into her hold, her cargo, worth today about two million pounds. Next, he turned south to the Indies. And then, when fame and fortune seemed secure, the Golden Hind ran on a reef. But by nothing less than a miracle, she was refloated undamaged. And in September 1580, after three years of suffering and drought, he was home again, laden with treasure, to enjoy the favors of the first Queen Elizabeth and with the gift of a silver cup to honor the first Englishman to enter the Pacific and circle the globe. And to receive on the decks of the Golden Hind itself, before a not entirely approving audience, 
the high honor of knighthood and the acclamation of Tudor England. With his accession to wealth and dignity, Drake lost no time in adopting the style of a country gentleman. He set up house in the Grand Manor in Buckland Abbey, first built in the year 1278 as a Cistercian monastery and once the home of Sir Richard Grenville. There he brought his second wife, Elizabeth Sydenham, after the death of his first wife, Mary. On this table, in the great hall of Buckland Abbey, is his sword. This thin strip of steel, which once inspired such fear in England's enemies. Beside it, as though still waiting for their master, lie his scarf, worked in silver and gold thread, and his ceremonial helmet. On his study table is the great Bible, which he carried with him in the Golden Hind around the world. See, on the top left-hand corner of the flyleaf are the doodles which he made with his quill pen. Drake had now many an idle hour to gaze out of his study window. The Queen's policies had undergone one of their frequent changes and great sea captains for the moment could languish on shore. But Drake was not the man to rest. His extraordinary vitality drove him into public affairs, and now he laid the plans of his famous Leet, a great granite channel running 26 miles across Dartmoor, which brought a supply of drinking water to Plymouth for the first time. As the Plymouth Municipal Record puts it, Sir Francis Drake Knight began to bring the River Meathy to the town of Plymouth which being in length 26 miles, he, with great care and diligence, effected and brought the river into the town on the 24th of April the next after. And to honor this man who brought the first water supply to Plymouth, there is held every year the fishing feast, when the Lord Mayor and Council of Plymouth assemble on the banks of the River Meavy. This 16th century loving cup is filled with water from the river, and from it a toast is drunk in these words. To the pious memory of Sir Francis Drake, may the descendants of him who gave us water never lack for wine. But before the water could thus be brought to Plymouth, events were shaping far from the town that were to send Drake again to sea at the head of a great English fleet. This is a globe of the known world made in the days of Elizabeth I. Round this globe ran a line. To the west, Spain, master of the world, alone had the right to trade. To the east, only Portugal. Spain drew her wealth from the fabulous gold and silver mines of the Spanish main. From here every year, a treasure fleet set out across the Atlantic, guarded by a crack Spanish war fleet. Drake and his fellow captains often raided the main, making their way by force into the treasure house of the new world. Let us look at the ships which were matched in this growing struggle. First, the Spanish galley, with its oars manned by the prisoners of the Inquisition. The orthodox Spanish galleons were designed as floating castles with soldiers in command. Their sailors, as Sir Richard Grenville said, were but slaves to the rest, to moil and toil day or night. So scant attention was paid to seamanship, and the galleons were clumsy and unhandy. The English ships were lower in the water and so more maneuverable. Whereas the Spanish method of sea fighting was to run alongside like this, grapple the enemy, and then fight a battle between soldiers just as on land, the English way of fighting was to maneuver the ships so as to cross the bows of the enemy, raking them from stem to stern with a broadside as they did so, then to go about and coming back on the other tack to let fly the other broadside. Using her ships and sea captains, Elizabeth I played a wary game of chess against Philip of Spain 
venturing as much as she dared without risking open war. But year by year, the Spanish fleet gathered its strength. And in the year 1588, her invincible armada set to sea. Plymouth Hoe in the 20th century. Plymouth Hoe, 1588. On the afternoon of Friday, the 19th of July, Captain Fleming of the Golden Hind brings news to the admirals of the English fleet that a great squadron has been sighted off the Lizard Point, 25 miles west of Plymouth Harbor. To this news, legend has it that Drake replied, we have time enough to finish the game and beat the Spaniards afterwards. The Armada lay off the Cornish coast all that day. That night, the English fleet sailed out from Plymouth Harbor. And as the Armada, with ships drawn up in a great crescent, swept down the channel, the English bowled down in line ahead to attack the Spanish southern wing, and the first engagement with the Armada began. During the evening, a great galleon was dismasted in a collision. She was captured during the night by Sir Francis Drake, her commander surrendering with typical Spanish pomp and etiquette on the deck of the Revenge. Drake, however, was supposed to be leading the English fleet, and his absence had thrown it into confusion. Daybreak found the English scattered over the length of the channel. By nightfall, they'd reformed into squadrons. Then the two fleets carried on a running fight, the English squadrons chasing the great crescent of the Spanish Armada until they anchored off the French coast by Calais. All seemed quiet. But Drake had a surprise for the Spaniards, fire ships. As they raced down the tide, panic seized the Spanish captains. And daylight found only a handful of Spaniards facing the English. Calais Castle, the greatest ship of the Armada, an enormous galley lay aground. Throughout that day, the battle continued along the Netherlands coast, and by evening, the Armada was no longer a fighting force. To the west of the Spaniards were the great sandbanks of the Dutch coast, onto which the wind was steadily driving them. To the east lay the English. They were trapped. Suddenly, across the sandbanks, a southerly wind began to blow. The remnants of the Armada turned north and gladly fled into the North Sea. Less than half of that great fleet saw Spain again. This was Drake's finest hour. Eight years later, he was buried at sea in Nombre Dios Bay of Panama. On Plymouth Hoe, his statue still gazes over the seas he made his own. He was a legend in his own lifetime.